welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another intensive period for power cuts, as ESCOM has failed to meet demand from its coal fleet. Chairman Screamer joins me to discuss what's going wrong and the prognosis for the next few months. Hi, Chairman. Hi, oh, Why were we back into load shedding for this past week in a bit? Well, it's the usual suspects of the coal fleet, as you mentioned in your introduction. And it's amplified by the fact that we've got uh, one of the units at Kuburg down at the moment. So that takes a whole 900 megawatts out, you know, for a long period. And that will come back in the next couple of months. But it will have to be taken down again because they couldn't actually do a part of the uh, life extension that they were planning to do. They weren't ready. So that's, uh, so we're going to have another unit come going down at, Ku at Kuburg, both for refueling and for the life extension. And then when that one comes back, we're going to have Kubo going down again. So that's really what's amplifying the current part of load shedding. But it really is the usual suspects of the coal fleet that uh, really is under maintained, been run too hard for too long. That's the, the legacy fleet. That's about 42 years of, uh, on average of age, those units. And then we've got the new plant out of Kosile and Madupi, which have really failed to be as stable as they should be. Uh, we know that there was massive, there have been massive build problems around those, those iron defects. Some of those are being addressed, but still we're seeing regular trips out of those plants and we know we still don't have the full uh, Kusile capacity. So really that's, that's where we are and uh, it's no different in many ways from where we've been for quite a few years uh, in terms of the coal fleets. In fact, we've seen this intensification of load shedding. Uh, as the backlog in maintenance has become more and more evident. It's back to the future in terms of uh, load shedding, uh, and it's been a very intensive and very depressing period. Is there anything ESCOM can do immediately to improve the outlook? Well, I think uh, the, the immediate uh, period, you know, as we get go into winter, there will be less uh, parallel planned maintenance. Most of this, the load shedding is related to unplanned breakdowns, and these are regular and very unpredictable. But we've also got quite high planned maintenance in the system at the moment of over 5,000 megawatts, around 10% or over 10% of the fleet's out. There will be some tapering as we go into winter, so that will help. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of focus on dealing with these units at risk over this period of load shedding. So there's fewer units at risk than we had uh, at the zenith of this latest ro load shedding, so, but still quite a lot uh, of units that are either at risk of partial or full, full trips. So I think that that's the immediate focus will have to be, you know, winter, keeping as much of that fleet available. It usually operates better, the fleet, in the colder months of winter and the drier periods of winter. It usually does. Uh, but uh, th that's really all Eskim can do is, is taper back on its planned maintenance and try and ensure as much reliability out of the rest of the fleet as possible. Obviously, there's a problem with skills and they need to inject skills at these power stations. They've lost a lot of key resources at these power stations over the years. You can imagine morale is fairly low. I think the culture is, is quite d difficult at the moment. At Eskom, you're really on the back foot and you're putting out fires all the time. It cannot be an easy place to be working if you're at a power station. Plus. You've also had to do make, make quite a few interventions around uh, theft and corruption. So people have been fired or suspended. So morale can't be what it should be. And we really need all hands on deck. So I see one of the short term solutions would be to reach out to the original equipment manufacturers, particularly for those uh, power stations that are regular culprits and try and inject some skills from them. Uh, but that process will take some time and will probably come once we are coming out of winter. Is there anything that can be done more broadly to inject more energy into the system? Well, I think we need all uh, the, the role players really singing from the same hymn sheet, and we're not really seeing that at the moment. So if DMRE, the policy department, DPE, the shareholder department, and ESKIM are all on the same page, I think there are a few levers that could be, be pulled. We know that there's some private uh, generation capacity that could be injected into the grid. Eskim estimates between 500 and 600 megawatts. They couldn't mop that up through the uh, short-term power purchase program, which they've abandoned because they couldn't get a, 
a regulatory approval for a sort of cost recovery mechanism. They're now looking at a standard offer to try and mop that up. They need approvals uh, throughout the system as usual from the Treasury, from the DMRE. I think that should be done urgently. There seems to be some uh, sort of disputes around that at the moment. But I think we need those, those players to really be singing from the same hinge sheet and looking at what is immediately available. We know there's some additional capacity available from the existing renewables RPPs around 200 megawatts. These are not huge numbers, but I think if it's, if it's uh, uh, available, we should be trying to, to get it back, get it into the system. It could decrease the intensity of load shedding. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 the other thing is to really unlock this 100 megawatt reform. What is the impediment? What is the red tape that's stopping it? We've seen so many announcements from so many different companies, mostly in the mining sector, but not only in the mining sector. So why are these not being registered with NERSA? Why are they not going ahead? And it seems to be this, this, this inflexibility around the power purchase agreement, and that has to be part of the package of the uh, uh, registration. That seems to be a problem. On Eskom side, there's definitely some grid evacuation issues, even at municipalities, don't know necessarily how to deal with the wheeling. This is a crisis. We need to get these sort of uh, frameworks uh, and structures in place to allow this to happen, because this is the quickest and cheapest way to get some real large amounts of megawatts onto the grid fairly quickly. You know, getting everyone aligned uh, together, and we're not seeing that, we really aren't seeing that. And then pushing, those, use, pulling those levers that are, existing levers that are available, existing capacity, and then definitely trying to unlock that 100 megawatt uh, reform, which, you know, is, is, is there. We can see there's appetite, but it's just not going over the line. How could the position be improved in the medium to long term? Again, it requires everyone, you know, aligned, and we, and that is very important. This, the political economy around uh, electricity is what's been one of the key issues that we haven't got out of load shedding since 2007, 2008. We just haven't been fully aligned or alive to the solutions. Uh, there's a lot of finger pointing. There's also, you know, relying very much um, on some of the wrong solutions. You know, there's a, a few that Eskimos somehow magically get this coal fleet operating back to an EAF above 75%. That's what the integrated resource plan dictates. Now we've seen analysis after analysis from very many, many stakeholders, very many big modelers in the system saying that's not likely to happen. And anyway, spending those sort of resources on plants that are scheduled for decommissioning from this year to 2035, 11 gigawatts of which is going to be taken, is that the best way to spend the money? So we need that political economy alignment, and that's urgent, and I think it's going to require the president directly to get involved in this. We need a sort of crisis management mode on this. We need to see it maybe similar to the way we approach COVID as a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, with work streams set up, with support for Eskom where it's possible to get as much capacity from this, this ailing coal fleet as possible, stabilise it as much as possible, but then really to unlock the future. Uh, and unlocking the future is really about renewables and storage. And 100 megawatt reform is one thing, but we need much more, and we need it to be done much more quickly. And the big impediment is the, the transmission system. It is not really fit for the future. And a lot of money and investment and time and energy has to go into that. And that also requires that restructuring at Eskom, that uh, new, the new transmission company be to set, be set up to start creating the environment for this uh, competitive market. So we really need some action around that. And I think if we get a sort of crisis management, a collegial atmosphere around this, much like we saw during the COVID, I know we made mistakes during COVID, but that sort of approach with government, business, labour in work streams, that might be a way to get us moving through this crisis. I mean, this winter could be devastatingly bad if the worst case scenario uh, prevails. I mean, Eskom's uh, scenarios, which are well known, show that they can be from zero to 101 days of load shedding this winter. And the way things are going, people are, are quite nervous that we're going to be erring on the worst case scenario rather than the best case scenario. So it really is a crisis. It drags down confidence, 
it drags down investment appetite. It drags down society, you know, this uh, continual load shedding. So we really need, I think, the president to put his hands around that and to knock some heads together because we're not seeing the, the political economy framework support that is required to address a crisis. Thank you. That's the second tag show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.